This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 51. Coming up on Space Time. Astronomers witness a star ripped apart by a rare type of black hole. Finding the universe's missing cosmic matter. And the ongoing mystery of the Big Wow. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have detected a rare intermediate mass black hole as it ripped apart and devoured a passing star. There are various types of black holes lurking throughout the universe. When they die, massive stars create stellar mass black holes, while the centres of galaxies are host to supermassive black holes with millions to billions of times the mass of our Sun. The problem is, astronomers don't find many intermediate mass black holes. Those between, say, a few hundred solar masses and hundreds of thousands of times the mass of the Sun. Often hypothesized to be the seeds that eventually grow to become supermassive, these intermediate-sized black holes are especially elusive, and very few robust candidates have ever been found. Now, scientists studying data from the European Space Agency's XMEM Newton Space Telescope, as well as NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory and the Swift X-ray Telescope, have found a rare telltale sign of what could be intermediate mass black hole activity. While looking through data from the Six Degree Field Galaxy Survey, astronomers detected an enormous flash of radiation in the outskirts of a distant galaxy, catalogued as GJ2150 22.2 minus 055 059. The radiation marked the remains of a star that had passed too close to a black hole and was subsequently torn apart and devoured. The study's lead author, Da Cheng Ling, from the University of New Hampshire, says the observations are the best candidate yet found for an intermediate mass black hole. It's long been hypothesized that intermediate mass black holes are likely to form, sometimes at least, through the merge of massive stars lying within dense star clusters. And that makes the centers of these clusters one of the best places to go hunting for them. The problem is, by the time such black holes have formed, their birth sites tend to be devoid of gas, leaving the black holes with no fresh material to consume and thus little radiation to emit, which in turn makes them extremely difficult to detect. Lynn says one of the few methods that scientists could use to try and find these intermediate mass black holes is to simply wait for a star to pass too close and then be torn apart and consumed, in the process releasing lots of energy which can then be observed, giving away the black hole's existence. This kind of event has only previously been observed at the centre of galaxies, not at the outer edges, where globular clusters reside. Lynn and colleagues sifted through data from XMM Newton to find the candidate. They identified it in observations of a large galaxy some 740 million light years away. The observations were taken between 2006 and 2009 as part of the Six Degree Field Galaxy Survey. The authors then used additional data from Chandra taken between 2006 and 2016 and by Swift taken in 2014. By comparing all the data, scientists were able to determine that the unfortunate star was likely torn apart around October 2003 our time, producing a burst of energy which decayed over the following 10 years or so. Based on their observations, the authors believe the star was torn apart by a black hole with a mass somewhere around 50,000 times that of the Sun smack bang in the middle of the mass expected for a supermassive black hole. Now, these types of star-triggered outbursts are expected to only happen very rarely from this type of black hole. And so the discovery suggests there could be many more lurking in dormant states in the peripheries of galaxies across the local universe. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show and talk about our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. You know what's great about science? It won't end until we know everything. And while that's never likely to happen, we can sure try. And one of the best ways to do so is through The Great Courses Plus. Not everyone's got the time or money to go back to university. After all, life gets in the way. And that's where The Great Courses Plus comes in. You can learn what you want at your own pace through engaging video and audio lectures available through The Great Courses Plus app. And there are over 10,000 different lectures to choose from, presented by true experts in their fields, like the one I'm listening to now. 
The Life and Death of Stars by Professor of Physics and Astronomy Kevin Stason from Vanderbilt University. And the best thing is, even if you already know your subject matter really well, he throws in these little gems of knowledge from time to time that get you saying, oh, I didn't know that. And that's really cool. It's a wonderful way to delve deeply into anything that interests you. And it's not just astronomy and physics. The Great Courses Plus have lectures in virtually every category. Music, history, photography, appreciating wine, philosophy, human behaviour. So that means you can get a better understanding of subjects that interest you already, or you can discover something totally new. That's what I love about the Great Courses Plus, and why I want you to check it out as well. So, to help you, we've arranged a free trial to get you started. Sign up for your free trial now by going to our special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That way they'll know you came from us and you'll be helping to support our show. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And of course, we'll include the URL in the show notes. And now it's back to our show. Astronomers have solved another of the cosmos's mysteries, finding the last of the universe's missing ordinary matter. While most of science's focus has been on finding missing dark matter and dark energy, which combined make up some 95% of the universe's mass-energy budget, not all of that remaining 5%, known as ordinary or baryonic matter, has been fully accounted for. Ordinary matter includes things like stars, molecular gas and dust clouds, planets, moons, asteroids, comets and meteoroids, as well as more mundane things like buildings, cars, trees, dogs, cats and people. But until now, astrophysicists have only been able to locate about two-thirds of the ordinary matter which theorists predict was created in the Big Bang. Now, new research led by Fabrizio Nicastro from Italy's National Institute of Astrophysics has found what they say is the last reservoir of missing ordinary matter, pinning it down to filaments of oxygen gas at temperatures of around a million degrees Celsius. The findings reported in the journal Nature will help scientists testing the Big Bang Theory to figure out the baryon census of hydrogen, helium or everything else on the periodic table. Researchers have a good idea where to find most of the ordinary matter in the universe. About 10% sits in galaxies, and close to 60% is in the diffuse clouds of gas that lie between galaxies. In 2012, scientists predicted that the missing 30% of baryons were likely to be found in a web-like pattern in space called the warm-hot intergalactic medium. To search for the missing atoms in that region between galaxies, scientists pointed a series of satellites at a quasar called 1ES 1553. Quasars are energy beams generated by black holes at the centres of galaxies as they consume huge amounts of material. You see, black holes are messy eaters, and so not all of the material falls beyond the event horizon to disappear forever within the black hole singularity. Some of it spills out on the sides and is directed by magnetic fields to beam out as powerful jets of energy called quasars. Scientists then observed how the radiation from this quasar was passing through the space towards Earth. It's a bit like looking at the headlight beams of a car through fog. Initially, the authors used the cosmic origin spectrograph on the Hubble Space Telescope to get an idea of where they might find the missing baryons. They then honed in on those baryons using the European Space Agency's XMM Newton Space Telescope. The team found the signatures of a highly ionised oxygen in gas lying between the quasar and the solar system, and at a high enough density so that when extrapolated to the entire universe, easily accounts for the missing 30% of ordinary matter. Of course, their quest isn't over yet. The researchers will now need to observe more quasars to confirm their findings, looking at different parts of the sky. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. One of the most enduring mysteries in astronomy is the Big Wow signal. Represented by the code 6EQUJ5, the Big Wow was an unusually strong narrowband radio signal received on the 15th of August 1977 by Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope, which at the time was being used by SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. The signal appeared to come from the constellation Sagittarius, and it bore all the expected hallmarks of extraterrestrial origin. Astronomer Jerry Amon discovered the anomaly a few days later while reviewing the recorded data. He was so impressed by what he saw that he circled the reading on the computer printout 
and wrote the comment WOW in bold letters in the margin, leading to the event's widely used name. The entire signal sequence lasted for the entire 72 second window during which the Big Ear was able to observe it. However, despite more than 50 attempts since, it's never been detected again. The story of the Big Wow really begins back in 1959, when Cornell physicist Philip Morrison and Giuseppe Cocconi wrote a paper speculating that any extraterrestrial civilization out there attempting to communicate using radio signals would probably focus on a frequency of 1420 MHz, 21 centimeters, the frequency naturally emitted by hydrogen, the most common element in the universe, and the one which would therefore be a natural starting point for any technologically advanced civilization studying the cosmos. The WOW signal is not a message. 6EQUJ5 is simply an unmodulated continuous wave signal written as an alphanumeric sequence representing intensity variations in the radio signal over time. Each individual character corresponds to a sample of the signal taken every 12 seconds. The space character on the printout denotes an intensity between 0 and 1. The numbers 1 to 9 denote the corresponding numbered intensities from 1 to 9. Intensities of 10 and above are indicated by a letter, with A corresponding to intensities between 10 and 11, B to between 11 and 12, and so on. The highest measured value in the Big Wow signal was the letter U, an intensity between 30 and 31, and some 30 times stronger than normal background noise. So, what do we know about the signal other than this? Well, it appears to have originated from an area in the constellation Sagittarius, northwest of the globular cluster M55, and roughly 2.5 degrees south of the 5th magnitude star group Chi Sagittarii, and about 3.5 degrees south of the plane of the ecliptic. The closest visible star to the signal's apparent origin is Tau Sagittarii, an orange giant about 25% more massive than the Sun and about 16 times its diameter, located some 122 light years away. There are indications that the star could be part of a binary system, and its movement across the sky also suggests that it's migrated from a different part of the galaxy. Over the years, there have been numerous hypotheses to try and explain the likely source and nature of the WOW signal, some more logical than others. But so far, none have achieved any real widespread acceptance. One idea involves interstellar scintillation of a weaker continuous signal. It's similar to the effect the atmosphere has on starlight, making stars appear to twinkle. The problem is that wouldn't exclude the possibility of the signal being artificial in origin. Other suggestions include sweeping energy sources or unusual one-time bursts. In 2017, astronomers suggested the signal could have been caused by emissions from hydrogen clouds surrounding two comets, 2066p Christensen and 3035p Gibbs, both of which were passing through roughly the right general area at the right time. The problem is a more detailed examination indicated that the comets weren't in the beam line at the time the signal was received. There's also another problem, namely comets are not radio bright at these frequencies. Other suggestions include more mundane explanations, such as signals from classified military satellites. That's the one I prefer, by the way. Or possibly an Earth source signal being reflected off a piece of space debris. Although that one's unlikely, because the hydrogen signal frequency is banned from civilian radio use because it's reserved exclusively for scientific observations. So, with no real answer to the mystery, the WOW signal, for now at least, remains the strongest candidate for an alien radio transmission ever detected. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley speaking with Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Now, the WOW signal was a narrowband radio signal that was received um, by a listening device on the 15th of August 1977. And the reason it's called the WOW signal is because when they read the, um, the uh, printout, Printer. Yeah. Uh, he wrote WOW on it. And the, so that's... hence the WOW signal. But there's a lot more to it than that, Fred. Yeah, the radio telescope in question was uh, operated by Ohio State University. It has the wonderful name of the big ear because in those days you listen to radio signals. Now we use radio telescopes to make maps of the sky that look just like images. Yeah. Whereas in those days you were definitely listening for a signal. And exactly as you've said, the astronomer who was working on the telescope at the time, his name was Jerry Amon, I think is the way his name is pronounced. He was looking looking through the records, a printout, and saw this enormous signal which lasted for 72 seconds and wrote the word 
wow next to it with an exclamation mark and it's still called the wow signal it's interesting when you look at the details so it lasted as i said for 72 seconds and that is a significant number because uh, the the way this big ear telescope worked was it sort of just looked in a fixed direction from the earth and let the sky go past, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So as the Earth rotates, the sky looks as though it's going past. It's why the sun rises and sets and all the rest of it. And so with the what you might call the field of view of that telescope, the amount of sky that it can see, a signal that is fixed on the sky or a source of a signal fixed on the sky would track uh, in 72 seconds. So what it means is that this thing didn't just last for 72 seconds, Two seconds. It was probably blasting out before that and after it, but the Big Ear telescope just captured the part of it when it was in its own field of view. Um, that's kind of as much as is certain, really, because there are other aspects you can concentrate on, like the frequency of the signal, and this is in terms of the frequency of the radio waves that are being measured. A number of different values have been given for that, but they're basically the same as the frequency that is given by natural hydrogen in space. This is actually at 1420 megahertz is the signal. We usually took a wavelength as well, which is 21 centimetres. Space is pervaded by this hydrogen signal uh, because there's so much hydrogen out there in the universe. So it was the same frequency as that, but it was much, much, much more intense. It was a very, very big intensity signal. So, okay, that's as much as we know for certain. What about the hypotheses as to what it, what it was? Well, the wow is a good indication of what uh, the astronomer thought. Yeah, maybe this is the first sign of extraterrestrial intelligence. It's still a possibility, Andrew. It is still possible that the wow signal came from an extraterrestrial source broadcasting that frequency, sending its signal out into space to say, here we are, we're broadcasting on the hydrogen frequency. It's what everybody's looking at. If there are other everybody's in space, here we are. This is the best way to tell people about it. Of course, uh, the, it, the downside is we have not heard of it. Ne since. Never heard of it again. That's right. It's This bit of sky has been analysed to death. It's actually in the constellation of Sagittarius, which it means it's towards the centre of our galaxy. And that's the more concentrated part of our galaxy. It's where there are more stars. So in that sense it is very interesting it could have been an extraterrestrial signal but has never been repeated it was a cry for help or something like that who could knows have been, could have been is there any suggestion that it was some kind of natural phenomenon yeah. Many, of course, because because scientists are pretty boring people. The first thing to look for is a natural, you know, a natural cause for something like that. And we've jumped to the perhaps the more uh, speculative idea right at the beginning. But yes, there are other possibilities, most of which have been kind of ruled out. There is one, the one most recent one that really got a, quite a fair bit of credibility was in 2017, and two comets were in roughly the right position, two comets, members of our own solar system, which we believe would have been surrounded by their own clouds of hydrogen. Um, so maybe the telescope was simply picking up these comets as they went past because they were nearby, certainly relatively nearby compared with anything out in deep space. And maybe they were the source of the wow signal. But that's had a lot of criticism. It turns out that the comets were not exactly in the beam at the right time. Uh -huh. um, the comets are not really that radio bright in the frequency of natural hydrogen. And why should that have happened? Questions of that sort have always been thrown at this. And the bottom line is it's it doesn't have an explanation. So the wow signal remains a mystery. Yeah, and I suppose they've already looked into the possibility of equipment malfunctions and glitches and things like that. All of the above, that's right. Yeah, yeah the, the, everything seemed to be working perfectly and the conditions were right. There was nothing in the way. No natural, so, uh, sorry, artificial sources, no foreign power satellites flying through your dish at the time when, when you want to be looking. Really interesting stuff. As an astronomer, Fred, do you have a theory? Just, you know, question without notice? Yeah, well, I'm, bo I'm a boring scientist, so I think uh, at the end <laughs> of the day... natural. A natural explanation yeah. will be found. And uh, we'll all go, oh, of course that's what it yeah, was. Of course it was that. Yeah, I, I tried to open the garage too many times. <laughs> that's what it was. Um, and the search was reignited recently. They were 
that, that I think well, the, the plan was to go and have another look for it. Yeah, and have another look. That's right. And I guess in that regard, it's part of breakthrough listening is the current big thing in t- terms of listening to or looking for signals from an extraterrestrial intelligence. This is the thing funded by Yuri Milner. It's breakthrough initiatives. It's all about looking for extraterrestrial life. And $100 million worth has been spent on two radio telescopes, one here in Australia, one in in the United States, to upgrade them so that they can spend roughly a quarter of their time looking for extraterrestrial signals. You You can bet your boots that the source of the wow or the Sight of the wow signal is one of the first places they look. That's Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. New data warns Australian liver cancer numbers and death rates have more than doubled between 1993 and 2015. The findings, reported to the 2018 Global Hepatitis Summit, warns that viral hepatitis B and C, as well as obesity, are behind much of the growth in these cases. So much so that they're beginning to overwhelm the limited number of liver specialists. Because the prospect of surviving the cancer is bleak, researchers say the only hope is to stop it from happening in the first place or find early curable cancers. A new study warns that obese women with no signs of diabetes, high blood pressure or high cholesterol are still at a higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease. The findings reported in the Lancet Medical Journal are based on a 30-year-long study of some 90,000 American women. The research suggests that obesity is a definite risk factor for heart disease, even among those who are metabolically healthy. Archaeologists have uncovered three tiny, extremely rare 2,400-year-old coins at a dig in Jerusalem. The ancient coins discovered at the Temple Mount represent some of the earliest evidence of Jews living in the land of Israel. Just 7 millimetres in diameter and of an almost negligible weight, the coins are made of silver and feature a Barnal motive with the ancient Hebrew inscription Yehud or Judah. Well, it's not quite Blade Runner 2049 yet, but police in Sydney are being equipped with smartphone compatible portable fingerprint scanners. The new scanners will allow law enforcement to register and verify the identity of persons of interest without needing to first return to the station. The scanners are also programmed to search national biometric identification databases, alerting police to a subject's outstanding warrants and criminal history. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Times also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.